A couple of years ago, the writer Sam Harris interviewed Charles Murray for an episode of his podcast. Murray is best known as the author of The Bell Curve, which infamously argued that social stratification, both along class lines and racial lines, is due to differences in innate intelligence, differences which are likely caused, at least in part, by genetics. The book was widely criticised at the time of its release, and Harris in turn was criticised for not only failing to challenge his host's beliefs about race and intelligence, but outright endorsing them before moving on to debate Murray on the policy implications of these supposed facts. But why am I talking about this two years later? After all, Harris is far from the worst person out there talking about race and IQ. It's because Sam Harris, in his introduction to that podcast episode, summarises with unusual clarity and conciseness a fallacy or set of fallacies, which I suspect lie behind why many rational people find Murray's arguments quite persuasive, and why many opponents of Murray find his claims difficult to argue against. People don't want to hear that intelligence is a real thing. People don't want to hear that a person's intelligence is in large measure due to his or her genes and that there seems to be very little we can do environmentally to increase a person's intelligence, even in childhood. It's not that the environment doesn't matter, but genes appear to be 50 to 80 percent of the story. People don't want to hear this, and they certainly don't want to hear that average IQ differs across races and ethnic groups. Damn, that's a lot of bullshit to squeeze into such a brief span of time. But helpfully, Sam's confused introduction offers us an insight into the thinking behind these false beliefs, and how the false intuitions about genetics which the average non-expert is likely to possess can be exploited by charlatans. Let's take a closer look. When somebody claims that IQ, or height, or any other trait is 80% or 50% or any other percentage genetic, what they mean, insofar as they are making a scientifically meaningful claim at all, is that that particular trait, when measured in a particular population, has a heritability index of 0.8 or 0.5 or whatever. A heritability of 0.8 does not mean that 80% of your IQ is determined by your genes and 20% by your environment. That makes no sense. Instead, heritability tells us what proportion of the variance in a phenotype, like IQ, within a population is explained by variance in genotype. If the heritability were 1.0, I could, in principle, read your genome and tell you your IQ with perfect accuracy. If the heritability were 0, then knowledge of your genes wouldn't be useful for predicting your IQ at all. Intermediate values represent the precision with which you can predict IQ based on genotype, it may seem from the description I just gave that the higher the heritability, the greater the causal role played by genes. But this is a mistake. To see why, consider the trait of wearing glasses. Wearing glasses is highly heritable, as many of the conditions that they are used to alleviate are genetically influenced. But it is obvious that the wearing of glasses itself is not genetically caused. Likewise, if a society decided for some reason that everyone with ginger hair should have a hand chopped off, then the number of hands that a person has would become highly heritable. These are examples of how environmentally caused traits can be heritable. A high heritability can just as easily result from discrimination against a particular trait, like hair colour, or, say, I don't know, skin colour, as it can result from genetic causation. Genes are not the only thing that we inherit. Discrimination is also heritable. Additionally, traits that are genetically determined often have a very low heritability. For example, it is genetically determined that all living humans have exactly one head. But since genetic variation does not help us predict how many heads a person will have, the heritability of heads is zero. If you remember only one fact from this video, let it be this one. A trait can be environmentally determined and still be highly heritable. Likewise, a trait can be genetically determined and not be heritable at all. But if genotype is such a strong predictor of IQ, regardless of causation, doesn't this mean that the environmental factors can only have a very small effect? At parenting, poverty alleviation, investment in public schools, and tackling discrimination will have little to no effect on outcome. After all, 
environmental differences predict only a small proportion of the variation? No. The answer is no. To see why, consider an island. The inhabitants of the island vary in height, with an average of 150 centimetres. The society on this island is strictly egalitarian, and there is no variation in environment. Everyone's treated the same, gets the same food, etc. In such a society, the heritability of height would be 1.0, as all variation would be genetic. Now, imagine that people discover a new, more nutritious source of food. This new type of food is shared evenly, just like the old one, so it remains the case that heritability must be 1.0. No differences in height are predicted by environment, and certainly not by diet. Does this mean that there could be no increase in average height when nutrition improves? Of course not, and there almost certainly would be. Depending on how stark the differences in nutrition are, their average height might increase by 10, 20, even 30 centimetres. Heritability is able to remain high because, at any given time, environmental variation has no correlation with height differences. But it's clear that the difference in average height between the two time periods is due to environmental changes. This isn't an entirely hypothetical scenario either. In the early 20th century, the Dutch were significantly shorter than white Americans. A couple of generations later, and they were significantly taller. This change is widely attributed to changes in lifestyle. When it comes to IQ or educational attainment, a high heritability doesn't imply that environmental interventions like education or welfare programs have no effect. Heritability tells us nothing about the potential impact of environmental change. The final false intuition, and perhaps the most poisonous, is the notion that because a trait is heritable, a difference in trait averages between two groups is likely to be at least partly genetic in origin. This is most often brought up in the context of the differences in average IQ test results between black and white Americans. To see why this isn't the case, consider a second island identical to the first in every sense except that its inhabitants didn't discover the new food source. There will be a significant gap in the average height between the two populations, and the heritability in both cases will be 1.0. But we already know that the cause of this difference is environmental. Heritability tells us nothing about the causes of group differences. Murray, who's better informed than Harris, knows this, and in The Bell Curve even briefly acknowledges it as technically true before quickly moving on. Murray, and others who agree with him, attempt to get around this problem by listing off miscellaneous results that they imagine rule out an entirely environmental explanation. For example, adoption studies that supposedly show that an IQ gap persists, albeit in reduced magnitude, even among black children and white children who are both adopted by white families. Now, the results of studies like these are kind of all over the place. Some find big effects, others find very little effects. Many also have quite questionable methodologies. But I'm not going to address any of that here, because Murray's whole argument here is a distraction. Even in principle, studies like these cannot do what Murray seems to think that they can do. The problem with fancy attempts to control for environment in studies like this is that it's fundamentally impossible, short of plugging babies into the matrix, to ensure that people with different genes experience exactly the same environment. You can take a black kid and put them with middle-class white parents, but this won't change how they're treated by wider society. They won't have the same experiences with teachers, with peers, or with cops that their adopted white siblings do. So long as we live in a society in which people are treated differently on the basis of the colour of their skin, not even the clearest results from the best designed adoption studies in the world are worth diddly squat for determining whether a racial difference is due to genes or due to the environment acting on those genes. The same goes for when Murray points out that white Americans outperform black Americans on IQ tests, even when you control for factors like parental income. It's an exercise in special pleading, nothing more. Heritability can tell us nothing about the cause of group differences. One day, we will start to learn how, on the molecular level, any particular gene affects the brain, and how these differences in the brain influence the traits that we value. But we are not there yet. And pretending that we are, in order to explain away societal injustice, is pretty deplorable. It is, however, sadly not uncommon. And it seems to be getting worse. 
It seems barely a week can go by without some semi-serious academic explaining why women can't do physics because evolution, or why nationalism is a good Darwinian strategy, or why transgender people don't really exist. Biological determinism and crude scientism seem to have come back into fashion in a big way. That's why I decided to make this channel, to fight back against pseudoscience peddling charlatans who increasingly seek to misappropriate the language and authority of science to advance a reactionary agenda. To that end, I'm starting a Patreon account. If you'd like to and are able, please consider supporting the channel. This one was fairly simple because Sam Harris made a fairly textbook mistake, but it can take weeks to do the research needed for a single video, so any little help can go a long way. If you want to help support the channel but aren't able to do so financially, liking the video, making a comment and subscribing is really helpful. Silly as it seems, this type of engagement is what YouTube's algorithm uses to decide how hard to push a particular video or channel. Either way, thanks for watching.